I will say, I asked God, I said, what do you need me to speak on? And he said, you're going to speak on what I already showed you. And I was like, okay, God, well, I'm speaking to the church, and I already know these people. I was like, so how do you want me to put this? Because it's really hard to put words to people you already know. You know what they're going through, you know what they do. I literally see you guys from the platform. I know how you worship. He's like, well, you can speak to them like you would a bunch of strangers. Like, if I called you somewhere else to speak, that's how you're going to speak to them. No, I can't. He says, well, you're going to speak to him like you're speaking to yourself. So that's what I'm going to do. All right, so while we're on the topic of labels, if you were here Wednesday night, that's what we were teaching on. God was dealing with me about the label I had become the shame of, the addict of Christ. There was a part of me that longed to be in God's presence. Calling out in the spirit, speaking in tongues, that was a part of it. But there was so much more. I can't explain it, but it was there. And I wanted to do whatever it took to never lose this feeling and to find out how much deeper I can go. I mean, if we can speak in tongues, you know the feeling it's in. And it's already good. How much more amazing it would be if we could just go past that into somewhere deeper. I have yes. put it on here. Amen. Except, I've been told, I shouldn't call myself an addict of Christ. And because, no Christian should be addicted to anything, including God. Now, really, the only thing I des desired was a feeling, a tingle or fluff. And there's more to God than a fluffy feeling. Like, yes. We got our Bible, hello. Get it together, Brittany. In fact, what, is it, what I desired probably isn't even real. All those youth camps, all those revivals, just a hyped up feeling of excitement, being in large groups, from a concert like atmosphere of a church. And no matter how many times I go to the altar, I won't find this feeling in any church. I don't even need to go to the altar at all. Not every service, just when there's a call for prayer. Because, I mean, after all, the same spirit here at the altar is the one in the back of the church. So I can praise God right here in my church seat. Probably don't even need to stand up. Amen. Come on, that's good. God will move as he pleases. God is right here with me. He's here in my house. I really don't need to go to the altar. The altar isn't even a place to sacrifice my praise. It's a place of prayer to petition God and make my requests known to Him. Yes. However, it's amazing that I allowed myself to foolishly believe these lies. Looking back at it now, I used to choose God over this shame of the label. I love sacrificing my praise at the place of sacrifice. I would jump, I would shout hallelujah. I would raise my hands, I don't care if it looked like the spotlight was on me, and I'd sing as loud as I felt and off key if it needed, if it warranted. I mean, have you ever screamed God's not dead as loud as you could Amen. in the song? Yes. And then it goes on. I would clap. I would kneel like I was serving a king. I would bow. I would sit on the feet of Jesus here on the floor. Yes. And I would even lay down face first because my body, the temple of the Holy Spirit, was also a part of that sacrifice just like the girls singing joy. I was a fool to believe the lie that it was a sin to desire God's presence and to never seek out this aspect of God. And then on January 24th, God showed the lie for what it was, pouring these scriptures out over me. And I am going to read them real quick, but I specifically had to say this take. Pastor Todd has been going over these verses already Wednesday night since that. So it's like all fun. Alright, so, Jeremiah 29, 13. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Matthew 6, 3. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you. And just in case, kingdom also refers to salvation, and righteousness means holiness. Yes. So you can still amen. seek the presence of God after you're saved, and after you got your life right. Yes, amen. Alright, Hebrews eleven sixteen, Specifically the NIV version. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For those who come to God must believe he is real, and he was a rewarder to those who seek him. And the King James Version, however, it specifically says, a rewarder to those who diligently seek him, yes. which also translates to earnestly, yes. which also then translates to eagerly. Yes. In Psalms 24, 5 through 6, and this is my paraphrase to make it quicker, the generation who seeks the face of God will receive blessing and vindication. Yes. 
In Lord. Psalms 119, yes. 2, blessed are those who seek him with all their heart. Just a piece of it. Proverbs 8, 17, the Passion Translation. I know everybody hates this, but I love the wording on this one. I will show my love to those who passionately love me. For they will search and search continually yes. until they find me. Glory. The original version I had picked up before the Passion Translation said, I love those who love me. Those who eagerly seek me will find me. Yes, Lord. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Yes. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Yes. Psalms 14, 2. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. Psalms 10, 4. This is the King James Version. The wicked, through the pride in his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not even in his thoughts. In Psalms 10, 4, this is a whole other translation. In his pride, the wicked do not seek God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Mama. Now, through these scriptures and these translations, this is what I got. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Well, if there's no room for God in my thoughts, then maybe there's no room for God when I'm watching TV, reading books, scrolling Mama. through my phone, and if I want to find God, maybe I need to put my phone down. Come on. And do not depend on your own understanding. And this is always a problem in worship teams. I can focus on God, but not when I'm focusing on the words on my sheet. And I can focus on God, if I'm, but not when I'm trying to sing correctly. Because if I'm trying to sing correctly, then my mind isn't on God. There's no room oh. for God on that little piece of paper and trying to get everything right. Then I'm depending on my own understanding and not Him. Yes. And then he says, I love those who love me. It's okay to love God and say I love you to God. I know Christ loved me, but I can say I love him too. Yes. And the biggest takeaway was God not only wants me to seek him out, but to eagerly seek him out. And this is the letter that I got. So, my perspective, letter from God. I want you to seek me. Don't just stop at the altar. I want you to eagerly seek me out. Seek me in, in your home and keep seeking me until you find me. Yes. It is not a sin to be addicted to me, to desire to be in my presence. So yes. be addicted to me. Let your heart be mine. I am with you, but I am hiding myself from you, like a game of hide and seek. Seek me out like you would a child hiding in a cupboard in your very home. Like a woman seeking carefully for the one lost coin, yes. turning over every yes. couch and sleeping out all the dirt Lord. just to find the valuable treasure. That's so seek me out. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank everyone again for being here, but also um, I want to specifically say thank you to our women. We have amazing women here. Amen. Yes. They work so hard, not just for the Lord, but for us. They they do a lot. We our ladies do a lot yes. at our church. Um, and I'm also going to start by saying that this is a message that God put on my heart um, for our church, but not just for our church. Um, it's just for Christians in general. Um, these are things that he told me about myself because I started praying um, it's been a little over a year ago and I asked God why my generation and the generation right before mine is not like our praying grannies <laughs> so to speak um, because I know for myself I'm not like, I, I, I don't, my kids don't catch me how I used to catch my mama in the bathroom praying for hours and hours and hours. My kids never caught me that way. And so I was wondering why I was not like that. Um, so this is 10 reasons why we are spiritually starving Christians. Reason number one, we do not read the word. Um, I know what you're thinking because I thought it too. I thought I read the word. Um, but we are a spoiled generation. We want everything quickly. We have our phones, as Brittany said. We have Instapots and air fryers and fast food and everything we need to 
make things quickly. Um, so we grab a devotion here, or a podcast there, or a sermon on TV, or a sermon on Facebook. And um, we don't really read the Word to read the Word. We, we read it to read it, not to understand it, is what I should say. Yes. Um, Matthew 4, 4, Jesus said, No, the Scriptures say that people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Job 23, 12 says, I haven't wondered from the commands that he has spoken. I treasure what he has said more than my own meals. Are we doing enough to get us by? Um, don't get me wrong, because devotions, podcasts, all of those things are good. They are carrot sticks, is how God told me. Um, carrot sticks are good. They're healthy. They are a good little snack. But I would not trade a carrot stick for Christmas dinner. I would not trade a protein shake or a meal replacement, anything, for ham and dressing. And if you would, then the altars are open because you're in the ground. <laughs> um, First Peter 2, 2 and 3 says, Desire God's pure word as newborn babies desire milk, then you will grow in your salvation. Certainly you have tasted that the Lord is good. Yes. Read his word. Um, reason number two, we are not worshiping God. Again, I know what you're thinking because I thought it too. We have every intention of worshiping God and we think we are. But some of the music we listen to has tricked us into thinking we're worshiping God when really we're only worshiping His works. Again, I'm not saying these songs are bad. I'm not saying that Christian music is bad. You're, I'm not going to stop listening to Crowder. I love Crowder. He, is, he can sing the phone book and it would be amazing to me. But some of the songs he sings are about how good God is and not about worshiping God. There is a difference I'm getting. Okay, so spot. Okay. I'm just gonna read this. The lyrics we put into our hearts and minds seem to assure us that our greatest need is to have pure God thoughts that make us feel better about ourselves. But Isaiah 6 describes a worship that has little to do with our personal emotions and even less to do with our own self-image. In Isaiah 6, we read about the prophet Isaiah worshiping a holy God. And Pastor Mike Turner put it this way, Despite all of his previous experience as a professional priest, a religious leader, a paragon of respectability and integrity, Isaiah was not prepared for the sight he was given of God on his throne. When the angel voices rang out through the heavens of God's divine nature, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, yes. the whole earth is full of his glory. Yes, Lord. Isaiah found himself undone. The yes. entire world he built for himself, his entire sense of identity was shattered by the reality of God's presence. Because the reality is that God's holiness was so far beyond Isaiah's personal identity that he could do nothing but fall to his knees and cry. Man. Right. <clears throat> Worship is when we recognize that we are not worthy to be in God's presence, but he allows us to come into him anyways. Yes. There's a difference in a song that says, I know that you can do this or that, and I know you can lift me up, and I know I can sing and dance for you. That's just an example. Um, but then you have a song like Forever by Carrie Joe. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon me. It goes on to say, Forever he is glorified, forever he is lifted high. It doesn't put us in the center. Yes. Um, Man-centered worship puts us in the center. It's what yes, I can yes. do for Him. God-centered worship is all about God and how amazing He is and how awesome He yes, is and how Lord. blessed we are that we even get to be allowed to have an audience with the King. Yes. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, Discernment is not knowing the difference in right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. But music isn't our only worship. Paul says in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Yes. We're called to worship God by it being a living sacrifice to Him, holy and yes. pure. How are we using our bodies? Are we feeding our minds junk? 
are we watching and listening to things that are contaminating the temple that he has led us to worship him with? Are we using our mouths to speak negativity? <clears throat> are we being conformed to the world or are our minds being transformed and renewed? Are we yeah. using our bodies as a living sacrifice unto the creator of heaven and earth? <clears throat> it's our reasonable service. Yeah. Reason number three. We're too casual with God and too formal with him. In an attempt to make God more relatable, our generation has become buddies with God. We are, while we're supposed to keep Him close, we have to remember to reverence Him yes. in all things and at all times. Yes, Lord. It's okay to casually pray to God and to keep Him close to us. That's what we're supposed to do. But calling Him nicknames in order to make Him our buddy takes away from the awesomeness of who He really is. Yes, Lord. He is Amen. not Daddy God or Sky Daddy or God Pop, God Papa or any of those things that we tend to call him to make him feel close to us. He is Father. He yes, is Adam, Lord. Amen. my great Lord and Master. He is El Elyon, the God Most High. He is El Shaddai, the All-Sufficient God. He is Yahweh, the I Am. Glory. He is yes. El the All-Powerful Creator. He is not my buddy. He is my everything. Yes. And we should respect and honor his holy name. By being casual with him, we're training our minds to treat him with less respect than what we're supposed to. He's not our dad. He's our holy heavenly father. And he is worthy of all glory, honor, respect, and praise. We put God in a pretty box and we dress him up as a friend. And we forget that he created the entire universe. Glory. He spoke creation into existence and breathed the stars into the heavens. He's deserving of our all admiration and most of all our love. Yes, we should be at our, at our, on our faces at his feet, not giving him a pat on the back like he's a friend that's made some minor accomplishment. Come on. He is Adonai, and we should honor him and reverence him in all we do. While we have to be sure we're reverencing him, we also have to stop thinking of him as some far off entity. He is omnipresent, everywhere, at all times. Loving him, honoring him, and communicating him like we would any person we see face to face is how we keep him close to us. Yes. If we treat him like his presence is unattainable, then it will be. Yes. We have to stop being so formal with him that we completely neglect to see him as a father. Deuteronomy 12, uh, sorry, 10, 12 says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require from you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve your Lord, your, the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. Reason number four. We've forgotten how to be still and how to move. Oh. So when I first hurt my back, um, I asked God why. Because I feel like I miss church all the time. I, I had just had pneumonia. I was tired of being down. And God spoke to me and he told me that I wasn't down. That he sat me down. And I don't know about you, but if you have ever had an important meeting with someone and they say come in have a seat it's important you're not going to stand yes. around and talk in a business meeting um, so what happens if we hear a sound we're usually going to stop get still and listen again if we're walking through the woods and we hear a twig snap we're going to stop dead in our tracks and yes. listen to our surroundings We've gotten so busy that we've forgotten how to be still and listen to what it is that God is trying to speak to us. We're running around making noise and sometimes we just need to stop and pay attention. Yes. What is God trying to say to us that we can't hear through our business? Or are we being too still? 1 Samuel 15.22 says, Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Yes. Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to heed is better than the day of rains. Yes. Are we forgetting that when God says to move that we need to move? We get scared of our thoughts. We get scared of what this one or that one will say. We freeze like a deer in headlights. We talk ourselves out of moving because we've already made the judgment in, the heart, in our hearts that we're being judged. Or maybe it's because we don't trust ourselves to do what God's asking. Either way, we have to begin to use our discernment yes. and do what God is telling us to do. Move when he tells us to move. Be still when he tells us to be still. Yes. Reason number five. We don't know how to pray. Again, I know what you're thinking. I thought it too. Um, but I want you to listen to this for just a moment. And don't raise your hands, please. But think of your answer in your head. When was the last time 
we got in our secret place and prayed. When was the last time we prayed for more than our own needs? When was the last time we prayed until we heard from God? We're all guilty of praying to have our needs known, but not until we have them met. Then, when our needs are met, we neglect to pray at all. Be honest with yourself and really think about when was the last time you prayed for your lost family members? When was the last time you prayed for our pastors? When was the last time you prayed for our community, our schools, or a family other than your own? When was the last time we prayed because we were just excited to talk to God? Yes. See, we tend to think of prayer as a way to beg for things rather than an open line of communication. Yes. But God doesn't only want to hear from us when we need something. He wants to hear from us all the time. Yes. The difference in having a relationship with God and being religious can be compared to how much time we spend with Him. Do we only pray when we're praying for other people? Do we only pray in church? And for some reason I didn't write this one down. And I wanted to because I didn't want y'all to see me fumbling to find things in my Bible. I do it all the time. Matthew 6, 5, and 6. Okay. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, yes. where they may be seen of men. Yes. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Amen. Don't just pray on Sundays. Don't just pray when we can see you. <laughs> or when you can be seen. I read somewhere that um, religion is a man sitting in church thinking about fishing. And relationship is a man fishing thinking about God. The same can be said of our prayer. When are we really communicating with Him? Max Lucado said, God rewards those who seek Him, yes. not those who seek doctrine or religion or systems or creeds. Many settle for these lesser passions, but the reward goes to those who settle for nothing less than Jesus Himself. Yes. More than the words we use, more than the way we try to make ourselves pretty or our prayers sound pretty or dignified before God more than the things we have need of, more than any of that, we should be praying to have a conversation with God. So my prayer life was awful. Um, I will not stand here and say that it was anything more than a religious obligation for me for a while. Um, I started, I, try, I would try to get on my knees and pray. I would try to do this and that, and I couldn't. Um, and I started walking down my driveway, and I started praying to God that way. And now I will walk up and down my driveway for hours talking to God. I will talk to Him all day long. I sing terribly, and He listens to it. <laughs> and He loves it. I know He does because yes, of the glory. things that He How is showing me. And some days it is all I can do to slip on a pair of house shoes and walk out my front door. But when I do, God meets me there. Yes, yes. glory. And He's excited. Okay, reason number six. We talk too much and not enough. Modern technology makes communication too easy. We say things via text, messenger, or posting passive-aggressive posts on Facebook. And we know good and well we wouldn't speak those things to that person face-to-face. -face. We call it addressing issues or correction. We even call it venting. That's what I call it. The plain truth is we need to keep our mouths shut. I've not read anywhere in the Bible that it says it's okay to gossip about someone, no matter what word we use to feel better about ourselves. I'm talking about myself, just so y'all know. <sighs> I was really bad about that venting thing because we are women, and we want to feel validated, and we want our emotions known. And it doesn't matter who we say them to, we want to feel validated by what we feel. Amen. But it's not biblical. <clears throat> And it doesn't matter how we dress it up, it's not biblical. Right. Um, we talk about grown up issues in front of and with our youth and our children, and this is doing nothing but putting a bad taste in our mouths yes. about Jesus Amen. and Amen. what serving Amen. Him is like. We have to understand that one day our children will grow up, and they won't always be kept in church by, by their parents. How we treat them now and how we choo choose to respect our fellow brothers and sisters now is shaping how they feel about ministry as adults. Come on, that's right. Y'all heard me on Pastor Appreciation Day. 
I've talked about the statistics of pastors. And statistically speaking, 80% of pastors report that ministry has negatively impacted their own children. And as a result, they have at least one child that will not attend traditional church services. 24% of pastors' children resent the church and its negative effects on their families. We cannot damage our children and teenagers with church negativity and Mom. church politics. That's right. Mom. I'm going to go ahead and disclaimer this. I'm not talking about these are things that our pastors are doing. These are things that the people in the church right. are doing. That, that's what we're doing. And we're... <coughs> We are spiritually starving our children, and we're starving ourselves when we open our mouths out of frustration or just because we're women and our human interests feel validated. Matthew 15, 18 through 20 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile a man out of the heart. For out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Yes. Is what we're saying edifying and ministering to others. So we talk about things to other people when we should be keeping our mouths shut, but then we neglect to talk to the person we have ought with. The Bible gives very specific guidelines of what we're to do when we're struggling with another person. We're going to go to that person, discuss the issue with them, and if it's not fully resolved, then we'll bring another person with us. We do not have to have a group counseling session to make things right. We have to first humble ourselves and keep our mouth shut. Then we have to discuss things in the way the Bible tells us to. Going outside of that even a little bit gives the enemy a foothold, which he will use as much as he possibly can. Yes, he will. After you've had the discussion with your brother or sister, we have to forgive and let it go by holding on to old things, you are continuing to build a wall with old bricks, and eventually that wall will fall and crush you both. True forgiveness begins with knowing that God's grace is sufficient, and if His blood can cover all sins, love covers a multitude, then holding yes. on to unforgiveness is saying that you have a right to hold on to something that God has already forgotten. Yes. Forgive quickly so that our Father in Heaven forgives us quickly as well. Which brings me to number seven. We are judgmental. Again, we all think we're not, but we are. We judge whether or not someone's doing their best. We compare their best to our best. Yes. I know just from our lives, people judge Wesley. They judge his abilities. They see him at a ball game and decide he's fine. But no one sees the exhaustion he goes through for weeks after he goes to the game for a couple of hours. It's so frustrating. But I know good and well that I do the same thing too. <clears throat> We judge whether or not we think people are serving God the right way. Amen. If they miss church, we're already judging if their reasons are good enough to miss the service, or we begin to look at all the messy things in their life and we assume they're not serving God because if they were, things would look prettier. That's right. That's we judge it. how much money someone has, what kind of car they drive, we judge each other's homes, or do we judge people because we think they're judging us for those things? Are we possibly guilty of judging someone because we think they're judging us first? I spent an entire year of my life cowering down and shrinking away because I felt judged. Some days, I still feel that way. But what was I doing when I was slinking away? I was passing judgment. Yes. I was being the judgmental one by assuming that everyone else was doing the same. Because I didn't feel worthy of being loved. I didn't feel worthy of being forgiven. I only felt worthy of being judged. Judgment doesn't mean we're only judging someone's appearance or their material things. It can mean we're judging the reactions they may or may not have to a situation. It, uh, it means we are assuming the worst about someone just because we've already judged their body language or their tone. Yes. The Bible says that Jesus himself didn't judge, and even after he died for us as a sacrifice, he still is not the judge. God is, and only God. We can judge people's fruits, but we cannot judge for any other purpose. Amen. Yes. <clears throat> we judge whether or not someone has truly changed based on their past, forgetting that the instant God saved us, we were 
have changed. Yes, Forgetting Lord. that God works instantaneously and the sinner who kneels at the altar this morning might be the saint that leads your children to Christ tomorrow. Yes, Are we the one whose life's been changed and we judge those around us because we think that they're still judging us? The truth is we're all human and most of us have things in our past. Some of these things, whether we want them to or not, shape the way we think and feel about stuff. For instance, I grew up overweight. I've always been overweight. Uh, that obviously has not changed. So the first time someone looks at me slightly wrong, first thing that pops in my head is, is my fat well showing? Or does my arms look too bad in this? I mean, there's always something that's going to pop into my head and I have to say no. They're probably just thinking, that's a really cute shirt. <laughs> but in my mind, because that's how the enemy works, right. he puts it in there the other way. So James said it this way in James 4.12. There's only one lawgiver, one judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbor? So who are we? Reason number eight, we do not know who we are. So we've been discussing identity in Christ both in our services here but also um, in our women's meetings. And um, so I'm going to kind of reiterate here what I've already said there. All right, so for just a moment, I want you to think about who you are. What's the first thing that pops to your head? For me, it's usually Wesley's wife or my kid's mama. Mama. Um, I'm my daddy's daughter, my grandmother's granddaughter. We might be the ministry leader or teacher or this or that. Maybe we're the office manager where we work or even this person or that person's friend or ex. We try to attach our identity to people, to things, to our jobs. And ministries, and in doing so, we compare ourselves to others. We want to do something better, different, bigger than others. We try to get more likes or comments on our social media. We want to be prettier, funnier, smarter, more successful. When we don't accomplish those things, we feel like we're missing something. Maybe yeah. we're dissatisfied with life because of the past choice we made, or one that was made for us. Things happen that are out of our control. Maybe and most likely we feel that we're not enough. We're not doing enough or accomplishing enough. We're not recognized enough or praised enough, or appreciated enough. And we're probably not. But when we're searching for these things, we're losing sight of our true identity in Christ. Yes. Sometimes we're identified by what other people think about us. Yes. We are kind until we get angry. We're patient until we lose our patience. We're smart until we make a dumb decision. We're understanding until we don't understand. We're so strong until we're weak. We're beautiful until we see someone much prettier. We're brave until we're scared. Yes. We're all humans and we all make mistakes. When we fall short of these things, it shakes us. It's hard to feel secure in who we are when we place our identity in things that can so quickly change. We're confused and hurt when these worldly expectations are our, are our identity because when we're not these things, we feel like we've failed. To truly begin to find our identity in Christ, we have to first begin by rejecting our identity in the world. It's impossible to find our identity in the world and also in Christ. The world may say you have to be perfect to be loved, but God says we're made perfect through Christ's strength. Yes, amen. The world says our success determines our worth, but God says we're more precious than rubies. The world says we have to know everything to be safe, but God says to lean not onto our own understanding, but to acknowledge Him, and He'll make our path yes, straight. Glory. When we begin to know who we are, we truly we begin to understand who God really is. Yes. This brings me to number nine. Reason number nine why we are spiritually starving Christians is because we do not know who God really is. Knowing God is so simple, but we complicate it. I know some of us had really great dads, and the idea of a father loving us was not far-fetched. But for some of us, we struggled to find a connection between our earthly fathers and our heavenly father. I didn't have a bad daddy or a bad stepdad. My daddy said no good that way. I was loved, and I'm pretty sure most days I still am. But my own insecurities made me shy and self-conscious, even at a very early age. I struggled to be myself, and I still struggle to have real conversations with my daddy here on earth. If we have to we have to find a balance between loving God as a perfect father, regardless of the earthly example we have, while also worshiping him as a holy creator he is, yes. and still yet having a personal relationship with him. 
We tie our identity up in our childhoods and up in the men that hurt us. And for some women, we struggle with severing that damaging bond because deep down, deep down, we're still scared to be hurt or rejected. If a man on earth who is nothing compared to the God of the universe can so easily toss us aside, then it's easy for us to assume that God would find us less than desirable. We put God in that box and we tell him we don't trust him enough to let him in. We tie our own arms behind our backs and we try to lift our hands to worship him. We put restraints on ourselves and on God. We ask him for forgiveness, but we don't forgive ourselves because we don't really believe that the blood that was shed for us covered our sins. It may have covered yours, but it didn't cover mine. God can love you. He doesn't love me. God can answer your prayers. He can't answer mine. When we make assumptions about who God is and about how he sees us, we're forgetting that he knew us before we were ever formed in the womb. Yes. When we say that God can save your soul but not mine, we're saying that the God of Abraham and Jacob is no longer the God of today. In Micah 7, 18, it says, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again and have compassion on us. He will subdue our iniquities, and that will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. I will perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which has sworn, which... <clears throat> Thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. When we say that we can't be healed, we're denying the power of God. When we hold yes. on to things that we've yes. said or done because our human shame doesn't allow us to easily forget, we're saying that we have a right to hold a grudge against ourselves or others when God is telling us He's already forgotten. Glory. That is who God is. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yes. He's still on the throne, and He's still a just, just God who pardons our iniquity. We don't know him, so we don't trust him to do all the things he says. Do we know that he's our healer and our provider? It's so easy to know God, but humans have complicated it. All you have to do to learn who God is, to learn who you are, to learn how to pray, to worship, to serve, to be closer to him, is to begin to read God's word. Yes. So feed yourselves before you start. Reason number 10, while Sister Helen comes to help me close, please is we don't understand these altars. We don't understand the importance of altars. <clears throat> altars are made for us to lay our sacrifices to God on. Yes. What are we sacrificing at the altars when we come down here? What does the Bible call the altar? God's table. Are we starving God of our sacrifices? I'm not talking about financially or our time spent in service to Him. I'm talking about are we sacrificing our minds and our hearts to God every single day? Or are we coming to these altars with prayers and not ourselves? Or worse, out of obligation because that's what you do during altar call. Today as Sister Helen begins our altar service, I challenge each and every one of you to bring your most precious sacrifice to God. Yes. To come to these altars with sacrifice and worship in mind. I challenge each and every one of you to come down here not to seek God for what He has for you, but to come down here and offer yourself to Him, to worship Him. Sometimes our needs can wait. Come lay yourselves on God's table and make these altars a place of sacrifice again.